So with that, I am Alyssa, Alyssa Wright. I am the um, OSPO at Bloomberg, and here is my Hi, I'm Tom. partner in crime. Uh, I support uh, Bloomberg uh, engineering uh, efforts uh, to manage our sort of supply chain risk. And can you hear us okay? Everything good? Good. Onwards. So first, uh, a little bit of what the agenda is going to look like. We're going to talk about where open source uh, sort of fits in um, when we think about Bloomberg. Then how do we manage um, open source and, and manage that risk um, and are sort of the guiding principles um, as, we, as we build um, and affect change. The third is uh, kind of a, the, the, the merging of when security meets sustainability and truly really like the cultural transformation that needs to happen um, that goes beyond tooling. Um, and, you know, I suppose I think can, you know, know much about, about this. It, that goes beyond tooling to really talk about the culture of change to really all of us be responsible for what a, a security looks like. And then for our call to action. So with that, uh, a little bit of an overview of what open source at Bloomberg looks like. You won't be surprised to hear, as most large organization uh, will tell you, um, we love open source. Open source is a part of everything that we do. It's a part of how we um, talk to each other internally. It's what we um, it's what we use to build our tools and our products and services um, to our external customers. It helps to accelerate our innovation. It is a way of process of how to do things that allows for um, uh, great work to be done. So, open source is our business. Um, it is ubiquitous. It is a significant part of our products and ut products util utilize open source software it is critical um, on all parts of our stack. Open source software is critical to our software development process. It is our community, um, both the communities that we participate in and how we communicate with the communi community with each other. Um, these are the principles that we bring to how we are, are uh, throughout our development work. And it is our infrastructure. Our customers rely on infrastructure dependent on open source. And so this is a, perhaps an open source progression um, you might have seen before. It is based on Ibrahim Hadid's A Close Look at Open Source Program Offices. And this is um, a very, to me, a, a, a very powerful um, maturity of what open source looks like in an organization. First, you consume open source. Um, this is a very common starting point. We have to figure out how to use these components and make sure that we're doing that in a legally compliant way. Then our developers start to participate in these spaces, um, fix things here or there. And then this is where I think the Open Source Program Office um, and in partnership with our engineering um, teams really start to make a difference. Like, how do we contribute to these open source projects that are important to us? Um, and how do we do that how do we shape future features that are aligning to our um, business goals? And how do we become leaders in this space? And so this is, um, the, these last two pieces are where the Open Source Program Office really, um, really looks to make the, its biggest impact. Um, and that's in part because open source, as we point out, open source is unavoidable. And the question is not whether to use open source, the question is how to manage its opportunities and risks when we do. And with that, I pass it over to my partner in crime. Thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, OK. Um, it's a challenge. So I'm not going to be sharing any silver bullets. There aren't any. Um, and uh, this is not a tech talk either. Uh, but we do have some guiding principles that kind of help us along our way. Uh, so first thing is pretty uh, pivotal is to define risk, because we will have different lenses for risk. Um, but at least from our organization, uh, organi our organization's perspective, um, we've got risk that we're exposed to, and through that, we expose our clients to. Um, malicious code, vulnerabilities, um, not being able to meet the um, legal obligations of licenses. Um, and these risks are ever increasing. Um, it's probably one of the most used stats. It's probably a more frightening one by now. Um, but um, the uh, increase in usage 
means there's an increase in risk for us. Um, and a lot of you will also be in organizations like ourselves that are, are facing emerging uh, regulations um, in numerous continents, um, including um, financial regulation, um, DORA, which is um, fast approaching us, uh, this CRA, which is coming up, and um, the White House Executive Order. Um, so that's kind of what we're faced with. Uh, and managing the risk is not easy because we have chaos as well. Um, it's very, very hard to do if your organization is anything like ours. We have many, many tech stacks, a lot of different languages that have accumulated um, over the decades. Um, different product types need different support. Uh, and then because of that, we have a very diverse tooling stack as well. Um, different ways of building our software, uh, integrating delivery systems, all these sorts of things. And of course, uh, we have the business need of delivering our products quickly. Um, so all of these are somewhat pretty huge hurdles um, to, to get over. Um, but we start somewhere. Um, we start by doing our best to know what our dependencies are. Um, this would not be an open source summit talk without mentioning s at least once, but I will only mention it once. Um, yeah, um, everyone gets a free one at the end. Um, they're not a silver bullet, again, um, but they are an excellent way to help you understand your dependencies. Uh, and that's definitely the starting point for any of this. Um, and once you do understand your dependencies um, and you understand the composition of your software, you can start to intercept some risk early on. And the earlier you do it, the better. Um, the shift left approach, um, you can apply in, apply in many, many ways, but um, we, we want to be preventative, not reactive as much as possible. Um, but we can't always be preventative. Um, so those S-bombs that every talk has been telling you to make, um, don't throw them away, uh, put them somewhere, store them, um, have an inventory uh, and mirror uh, and kind of um, pair that up with knowing where your software is being deployed or released and, and shipping. And if you have both those things, um, you start to be able to have visibility of what your exposure is. Um, maybe a couple of years ago, a lot of your organizations were being asking, you know, Am I impacted by Log4Shell? Where have I used Log4, Log4J? Um, in fact, last couple of weeks, I'm sure some of you have been asking that about another unnamed library. Um, where am I using this? How am I exposed? Um, now, on the surface, these principles are pretty simple, but um, implement, implementing them to cover your entire organization, which could in reality be um, 9,000 different departments, if it's 9,000 users, all doing different things, is pretty challenging. Um, Thankfully, we're not alone, though. Um, communities like this uh, help us connect uh, with open source efforts to solve these open source problems. Um, groups such as the OpenSSF and OpenChain help us drive um, best practices. We've got frameworks uh, such as S2T2F, which help us manage and measure the maturity of how safely we're consuming our open source software. And there are a lot of standards and tools that help us actually put these principles into practice, like Cyclone DX and Clearly Defined. Um, so from this, it sort of appears that we've got everything we need to uh, get there, but it's not quite there, because tools alone won't suffice. Um, I'm pretty certain that you can implement these things to cover a good percentage of your code base, um, but it would be some element of security theater um, without a very vital component, uh, and that is collective responsibility. Um, we really, really uh, pride ourselves in um, how we match up sustainability in open source uh, to its um, essential um, impact uh, on security. Um, to sustain open source usage, you need to manage risks, and to manage risks, you need to make it sustainable. Um, and so uh, collective responsibility is the act of sharing that, um, that burden and that engagement all the way across your organization. Um, I'll hand it back to Alyssa to uh, talk through what collective responsibility means for us. Thank you, Tom. So this is where security meets sustainability. Um, we're building a cultural shift towards sustainability, um, which is a cultural transformation where everybody gets involved um, in understanding that the open source that we, uh, that we work with every day is also um, a business value, a potential security risk, but also um, one that when maintained, when taken care of, uh, can be something for the public good. So we've been working a lot. Wait, sorry, am I going in the right direction? No. Nope. There we go. 
Uh, we've been working a lot with shifting um, from the focus of using software to our responsibility for them and the responsibility of uh, us sustaining and maintaining that. Um, and that is a collective responsibility that we all uh, carry. And so we've been thinking about, well, let me take a step back. And this is also actually coming from another um, um, to-do presentation. Why, as an organization, do we sustain open source? It's kind of organized into four categories. One is that if you really rely on open source, we must invest in its longevity. It is our responsibility, it's no one else's. Sustainability is a risk reduction activity. Um, it makes the products that we build safer um, and safer for, for our users. No one's gonna do this, this is all on us. Um, this is our collective uh, call to action. And it's a simple problem, but it persists. Um, for instance, the very beginning, maintainers need support. So we have been looking a lot about how to sustain um, the projects that are critical to Bloomberg um, and trying to build on tools and pilots and programs that um, other companies have, uh, have, have created frameworks for while also um, looking at what's special about Bloomberg um, and, and building some of our own that we hope can scale into other places as well. So we have been looking through philanthropy through the lens of technology. That we recognize, and I think this audience here knows it even more intimately than most, that open source contributions are both a business value, we do this for our business, but it also is a public good that we all uh, benefit from. And so we have a handful of open source sustainability initiatives. Um, again, some built on other, other work that's been done before, some that we're like to like kind of dive into here that are new, that are about sustaining um, open source projects with corporate philanthropy as a partner um, in order to make sure that like we have a more robust like and full ecosystem. One is the FOSS Contributor Fund. Um, just out of curiosity and because you know, callback is fun. Who here is familiar with the FOSS Contributor Fund? That's great. I mean, uh, it's so many, so about 50% of the room raise their hand. FOSS Contributor Fund is a way for an organization to have their engineers uh, vote directly on where we should, um, where we should send uh, money. Um, and so they oftentimes, like, uh, uh, people who are working with the code have the most insight about who, what, where the code would be uh, where money would be best spent. And so um, over the course of 2024, we will have committed a um, quarter of a million dollars to um, open source projects uh, through this voting mechanism. But that's not the only way that we think we sustain open source um, and sustain it in uh, a long run. We, we've also been developing a program to contribute time. This is called Open Source Dollars for Your Hours, and what it does is it matches uh, the volunteer time that people contribute to open source, that sort of grace area, like that, you know, we all work for open source for our job, hopefully, but there is stuff that may not be directly for a particular um, end goal or, an, you know, internationalization may not be fitting into uh, what you're supposed to be doing this quarter, but that volunteer time, that sort of invisible labor that hasn't necessarily been recognized as volunteer, like kind of volunteer work in your philanthropy um, uh, definitions, um, and is really the kind of work that keeps a project and a community alive. We have we we have designed a program that like recognizes that this is self-attest volunteer. Um, contribution to a project, and those hours will be matched with dollar donations up to a cap of $5,000. And so that $5,000 can go towards the open source project that you have um, been contributing to, or it could go to the American Heart Association, something that you don't necessarily have um, a way to give philanthropic hours to. Um, and so it's a way for us to understand that volunteer work um, looks many different ways, especially when you look at a technology company. Um, and volunteer work for open source projects make a, uh, a consistent public in impact um, to, to our world. 
And so towards that way, we hope that we build sustainability. We've been building these sustainability efforts, um, oftentimes with foundations to have teams working together on an open source project. Most recently, we worked with NumFocus and the Pandas Project on an eight-week series where uh, first-time contributors were supported by mentors to uh, contribute to the Pandas Project. And then we'll be continuing that on again, um, mentoring um, other new contributors um, with, the, with, with the Pandas Project. And so and I think if I look at the, at the um, just off the top of my head, like, you know, for a small group of people, we had like over 100 hours um, and many commits like to the Pandas Project. And so these are like models that we hope will create sustainability that match um, both money and time towards the problem of sustainability. And so is that, towards that, like this is our open source journey. Like we consume open source, we participate in open source, but to really contribute and lead in open source, we really want to tackle like the questions of sustainability uh, and be leaders in this space um, and, and think about how to have um, the projects that we rely on be uh, healthy and um, healthy and welcoming and sustained like for the long term. With that, our call to action. That's a very brief one. Um, okay, so um, really, I guess the message is your entire organization is going to benefit more. Uh, the more this becomes a collective responsibility and actually becomes collective, um, the more likely you'll be able to move from this sort of risk prevention mode um, that I think a lot of the supply chain related discussions have got us in to more of a kind of a facilitate and encourage usage mode um, because you establish these principles early on, um, you uh, allow us uh, to engage directly with our engineers to a point where um, we're not vilifying security folks, we don't see lawyers as a blocker. Uh, as much as a blocker uh, to things, um, and um, we end up with developers having a far greater ownership um, over what they're consuming, using, um, and it often results in a, a drive for better innovation as well. Um, and um, we all started at consumption, um, but it's that journey um, that Alyssa talked us through that um, helps us get to the collective responsibility, which is our collective responsibility. Thanks for listening. Um, and uh, enjoy, I guess, what's left of the conference. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I, I love your slide about the programmatic efforts to promote sustainability and prioritization. What are the things that uh, you think that help promote that? Like making sure that developers that are uh, either engineers or contributors to open source projects So if I understand your, your question, then I might have assumed some things, but are you saying that some of that volunteer stuff sh should really, could be considered like real work hours, right? And so how, how, um, how, we, how, how do you make the distinction then if like some of that volunteer stuff should be, should be work hours? Um, you know, it's, I, I think that question continues to remain like, unclear and vague, and so the only thing that we have is when a, um, uh, a, a, a contributor is like, this is clearly, I am calling this my volunteer time for whatever reason. Like maybe because they don't wanna have that conversation with their, their boss, maybe because it's so left field and they're learning something new and they don't wanna have the same sort of uh, timeline or expectations, but like, we're really relying on like the self attestation of like people being like, this is what I consider my volunteer work. In terms of the building it into the actual product delivery part of it, um, I promised I wouldn't, but I'm going back on it. S bombs, um, servicing more and more. Actually, yeah, I can 
made a big assumption, but I'm going to stick with it that everyone knows what these are by now. Um, and um, if you don't, I really envy you at this point. <laughs> uh, but those S-bombs and knowing your dependencies is kind of where it starts because really um, with how deep these dependency trees are and that Nebraska uh, um, uh, example, um, it, it without actually understanding what really is critical to delivering the products, we can't even begin to start to understand what we should be focusing our efforts on. And so all of that data, um, you can put it in plenty of places. Um, there's uh, a really good example is Guac. Um, Jeff's out here. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jeff. Uh, but um, once you start to really look at this data and understand your dependencies, you will start to see kind of a clear pattern of which projects are actually really providing the greatest value to our product delivery and therefore where we need to focus our efforts and treat them as if they are our own code because that's the essence of open source. So you mentioned sort of the depth of the dependency tree and I wonder if as you've uh, been trying to prioritize you know, your, your open source initiative at the moment, if you've been able to measure the proportion of the project That's a good question. So the question was, uh, with the data we've got with these S-bombs, um, can we start to see which are the high volume projects that um, uh, people are contributing to that we do have a, a high dependency on? Um, we're starting to. Um, I would say that for a lot of, similar to a lot of organizations, it's pretty um, anecdotal evidence that started it and there are some pretty obvious candidates as well. Um, I think what the data is actually going to help us more with is from those obvious candidates, what the day depend on. And um, it, again, Nebraska, um, we love that place. Um, those projects that are really far down on that stack, but are ubiquitous to, you know, um, there was a, a, a talk from uh, the Google, Google security team earlier, and um, they mentioned that Log4j was, um, I think, present in around 80% of the dependencies of Maven Central. And um, I don't think anyone was initially had a gut, you know, no one had a real gut hunch that, they were a high dependee on, uh, on Log4j, but they depended on some pretty big stuff they could name, and once they dig down, they'd see Log4j was probably one of them. So um, it's definitely one way to use that data. Um, a lot of the fast contributor funds are, uh, are uh, company based, but there is this group called FOSS Funders, which is uh, facilitated through the To Do Group, um, that where people who have organized FOSS funds in their own um, their own communities will talk about um, everything from the structure of what theirs looks like to how to consider like certain things. And so, if you're interested in that work, I can get you. I mm -hmm. like we should talk touch touch base. And again, for anyone who is on the To Do um, Slack channel, which is again a Linux Foundation foundation, um, it's a FOSS funders channel. Such a good question. Um, well, do you? I hate. You know, I, it's so funny to me because I have spent um, my entire professional career in like the business development of open source. Like I do like the business. And so I've always talked about ROI of open source. Like, you know, it's business value, X, Y, and Z, you know, up the wazoo, et cetera. Um, and it wasn't until like, I came to, to Bloomberg where people were like, you should stop talking about that. Like, it's not the only thing that's why we do open source. And, um, and I think that the combination of a real rec a, and recognition that, that open source is the roads and bridges of our, of our infrastructure, it, and this is infrastructure that we need to collectively take care of. Um, I think that we are, when we think about open source like that, we are using language from both 
business and and philanthropic impact at the same space, um, the same time. And I, 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 I wouldn't know exactly how to give direct advice. I think I would need to know more about like the specific project. But I, I do think that, um, you know, if if open source is the infrastructure, what what roads, what bridges are actually like you know tended for and take take care of? I think, you know matters. Um, so I, I think we will, I think, um, I think it's really powerful, I, I will say this, I think it's really powerful that philanthropy is a partner, an OSPO partner in, um, in understanding like the value of open source and you know I can say business value but they understand that it's a, um, it's a, a civic um, and, and person value as well. And I feel like I, I recommend people finding those those places, like in their own spaces, you know, whether you're coming from a company or your own own product, to find people who understand that that's um, that that open source is is not just a business value. That's a very good question. Um, Do I'm, you mind repeating yeah, actually, repeat the question. So um, uh, you're from South Korea, and there's not uh, a familiarity with open source contribution and participation and engagement. Um, well, I'll start by saying I'm pretty new to open source as well, um, and it was a mystery, and it was actually kind of daunting at first to join communities where there were relatively um, large swathes of some of the smartest people in the world gathering and talking in. Um, technical languages I didn't understand, um, but um, it's these events and the foundations that organize these events and the communities around them that really help. And so um, the Linux Foundation um, has a lot of subgroups um, where the barrier of entry, you don't need to be a member to, to start to join calls and just start to listen. And um, I'm a maintainer on an open uh, SSF project. Um, that's a subsidiary of the, uh, the Linux Foundation. And it just started by reading documents, trying to understand them, and then joining calls, you know, microphone off, camera off, listening, and um, that arch uh, consumption through to, you know, um, contribution and participation, um, you just slowly start to absorb. Um, and um, through me doing that, I know that several of my peers and colleagues um, have started being able to do that as well and feeling a little bit more empowered to do it. Um, but, um, if you are able to, the To Do group um, is a really good way of connecting with OSPOs all over the world. Uh, Alyssa and I were in uh, Japan at the end of last year, um, and there were some great OSPO events with um, OSPOs from many, many countries. Um, and they are really great at helping you um, get familiar with the communities that are out there and helping you integrate with them. Um, so I would join the To Do, sleep, to -do group Slack channel, um, introduce yourself in there. Um, and uh, you'll find pretty quickly you're connecting with people close by. And, and you know that, um, that, that uh, yeah, this thing. Um, this was written by um, Abrahim um, Hadid, who was the um, OSPO at Samsung um, for, for many years. He's no longer there. He's um, at, at Linux Foundation right now. But I know that Samsung at least has fluency around what it means uh, uh, to, to do open source, um, at least for business value. And, and we can connect you to some, some of those people. Cool. All right, thank you very much.